thanks for coming out tonight for our next lecture here in our Brookings Mountain West lecture series. I'm Bill Brown. Welcome again on behalf of my, all my colleagues at Brookings Mountain West and UNLV. We're here to talk about a subject near and dear to our hearts tonight, Nevada's advanced industries. And we're especially pleased to have a colleague, Mark Moreau, out from Brookings in Washington, DC. And, but M Mark is not just another scholar visiting. Mark's been intimately involved in the founding of Brookings Mountain West. He and Rob Lang co-wrote a study that uh, looked at this region back in 05, I think, right? No, seven? Oh, yeah, seven. seven, yes, published in seven. Just the time for the economic crash. Right. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, need it. And Mark's uh, helped uh, with Rob Lang, helped write an economic study of the region. Mark's has lived and resided in the region in, the, in his exciting life. He's, uh, but this is the first time we've had you actually speaking in our lecture series, so that's long overdue. Uh, but Mark's gonna talk tonight about some of his ongoing research and uh, give us, uh, I don't wanna forget anything. Mark also is a principal author of uh, the quarterly uh, economic analysis of the region we do called the Mountain Monitor. So if you're on our listserv, you, you'll, you, see my announcements about this publication. If you're not, we'd be happy to add, add that to you. So Mark's gonna have a conversation tonight. We'll have time for questions as always. Uh, thanks to our co-sponsors from Greenspun College. We'll have the lecture up on our website in a few days. As early as tomorrow, we'll have Mark's PowerPoint up on our website. So if you wanna refer back to any of the data points that Mark brings up, you'll have a, a reference site for that. So I'll let Mark take it away. Good, well, good, good evening, everybody. And uh, it's great, uh, great to be here. And uh, what I'm, I, uh, uh, so I, I'm a senior fellow at Brookings. Uh, and I'm gonna preview, as, as uh, Bill said, some, some new work. Uh, this is, you know, really uh, the first time we presented uh, this work. It's going to, evolve into a major national uh, study that will release in February. Um, and I wanna talk about what we're calling advanced industries. Uh, these are R&D and STEM uh, oriented industries. I'll explain what those are and what we mean by that, that I think we could say inordinately drive uh, regional and national economies. Uh, they're the main sources of high wage employment in America. You'll see what I mean by them in a second. Uh, they're not just uh, advanced manufacturing, uh, such as the aerospace industry. It's not just advanced services like software. Uh, this is a new cut that tries to get beyond somewhat artificial distinctions between manufacturing and services. We don't think that the two can be separated uh, very easily. We think that high tech and low tech is not a particularly helpful distinction. Uh, and, you know, I believe, I think we could safely say that the swath of industries we're talking about here capture a lot of what matters to the nation and states and regions especially, and we'll talk about why that too. Uh, virtually all of Nevada's target sectors uh, for economic diversification are advanced uh, industries. Uh, many of Las Vegas's and Nevada's coolest and highest profile companies and most important companies are advanced industries. Switch is a, a you know, classic advanced industry company, IGT, it's an advanced industry company. Yes, Tesla is an advanced industry company. We'll go into what, what makes these companies advanced in our view. But they in, or, matter inordinately to Las Vegas's future, the state's future, and America's future. And you'll see why there are reasons uh, to be excited about their future, but there's also significant causes for concern. Um, so what I'd like to do is take about a half hour or so to introduce you to the sector. Um, I want to, you know, first provide a little context of the moment, why we think this is an important conversation to have, give you some input on what 
the advanced industries are, uh, what they are, why they matter, uh, and uh, uh, then I want to give you some trends. Uh, what's going on uh, with the sector, uh, both mostly nationally for now, but a few have done a few drill downs on what's going on here. Uh, after that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how regions uh, can promote the emergence of the advanced industry uh, sector. So I want to talk a little about strategy. Um, so, and I'm going to leave time so we can hear your uh, views. I'm really interested in your reactions and uh, probes. Let's just look at a little at the context though. Uh, uh, nationally and in Nevada uh, and Las Vegas, Clearly, the economic crisis, uh, you know, was something of uh, uh, existential challenge to the existing uh, uh, growth model uh, of the nation and especially of regions. Uh, employment and output crashed, uh, have recovered quite slowly. You could see, you know, Las Vegas lost more than 100,000 uh, jobs, 122,000 jobs. Uh, Recovery, uh, the number may be a little higher now than the number I show here, but you have not gained back uh, the jobs you had. This is one of the harshest uh, uh, crashes in the country. Uh, so it's appropriate, uh, I think, uh, it's, it is appropriate that a lot of concerns were raised, uh, voiced nationally and locally, and it, uh, about the fundamental viability of the basic economic mon uh, uh, model of the economy. I think through this entire period, a lot of people have been trying to figure out what matters in economic uh, uh, development, uh, what matters, uh, you know, what are, where are the uh, 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 sources of, of sustainable, long-term competitive growth. Um, you know, clearly at Brookings, uh, we started talking very soon after the crash, influenced by some very insightful remarks from uh, Larry Summers at the time uh, about the fundamental need to pivot nationally and re locally from a consumption-based, import-oriented, real estate-driven economy and, and uh, uh, with at least diversification into complementary source of technology-based, technology-oriented, uh, higher value traded sectors. Uh, uh, and I think that insight uh, has been helpful um, you know, and uh, in 2011, uh, we, we did uh, work, uh, uh, I, uh, we had our dates wrong, it's more recent, it seems like longer ago. In 2011, uh, uh, the, my group at Brookings uh, worked with Brookings Mountain West and SRI International to, li to deliver a strategy uh, to help, that help, to help the state uh, diversify. To, to the state's credit, responded to crisis with a sense or an intuition that it had to uh, operate differently, uh, at least in theory. So I think we provided a fact-based strategy um, that focused on eight target uh, sectors uh, projected to grow uh, in the post-crisis uh, uh, environment. Uh, and if you look at the targets, uh, you know, tourism, gaming, we were thinking especially of growth opportunities within that industry in its uh, high growth, high t higher tech portions, but business, IT, ecosystems, aerospace and defense, manufacturing, clean energy, logistics and operations, health and medical services, mining, agriculture. So these were what we said at that time uh, seemed to be plausible growth areas for the state. We, we our criteria were that the state had some toe held in them and there were projected uh, projections of growth uh, 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 in, and good uh, opportunities uh, in the years uh, going forward. Uh, if you look at these targets, uh, uh, they have a distinctly high-tech uh, growth orientation. I would note several of these are in fact growing much faster uh, than the rest of the economy now. now we can talk about that. So uh, that's the context uh, for this work. Let's talk, uh, you know, you know, I just, uh, so here, here's the thing I want to say. Uh, no less than five of those industries 
uh, are uh, that we what we identified at that time uh, we we are now calling advanced industries. Uh, um, uh, what are they? Advanced industries, super sector categorization resulted from the impatience I suggested with sort of artificial delineations and trying to get at a single uh, label and a, and, and a designation of a single swath of industries that matter uh, uh, inordinately uh, and, ha and, and that have a lot of common in common. So we kind of wanted to get to a, a unified field theory of the high value industries in America that matter most and that sit amidst the, the most critical trends. I mean, you, you know, these are uh, uh, industries that uh, uh, are s situated amidst the relentless pace of technology change. Uh, they are blurring the distinction between manufacturing and services often, and they're pervaded by digital solutions. You know, er uh, that you can't uh, se se separate the digital world from the material world. Uh, we were trying to get at uh, how some of these things uh, are, are converging. Um, so we worked out a, a definition uh, of a group of strategic industries based on, on just two metrics, uh, that they had more than uh, one and a half times the usual uh, industry's R&D investment uh, and had uh, 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 ab uh, about twice the nation's STEM science, technology, engineering, math, worker uh, intensity. So, and we, def we said advanced industries are the R&D uh, intensive industries that concentrate the nation's STEM uh, technology, engineering, math, workforce. So I think you could see, you could see that you can uh, you know, focus on uh, a couple extremely, uh, 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 you know, just a few metrics can uh, uh, identify a kind of firm that is inordinately important. Uh, what are these industries? Uh, they include uh, you know, 35 advanced manufacturing uh, industries ranging from aerospace, pharma, motor vehicles and parts, medical equipment, uh, the energy uh, swath, some portions of it uh, are critical. The fracking uh, uh, development is a quintessential advanced industry. Technology innovation uh, uh, is driven in hugely productive, huge productivity gains, uh, gains in the oil and gas uh, world. Uh, electricity generation, uh, all of our uh, clean tech uh, industries are uh, advanced industries. And then, and then we see 12 services, uh, telecom, R&D consulting, software, computer system. This is an intuitive group. You know, all of these, these are the, the highest tech, uh, really most uh, uh, productive industries we have uh, in Las Vegas. You know, these are companies like Ford, Boeing, Lockheed, Intel, Dow, Lilly, Exxon, Google, Apple. At the national level, here it is. It's, uh, you know, IGT, Supernap, but Bally's, iStream Planet, Originate, Banjo, all these cool companies here. Uh, the ones that you have your eyes on that seem promising and, and uh, you know, offer or are uh, advanced industries. Uh, so that's the what uh, of the sector as to why it matters. The short answer is, you know, these uh, industries really anchor uh, regional uh, and national economic competitiveness. Uh, the sector is modest in size, but it does have some heft. This is about 12.3 uh, million workers. 9% of the U.S. Uh, uh, employment, uh, direct employment, that leave, we'll talk about uh, multipliers, but uh, we're talking, uh, you know, 4.4 million work more workers than finance, insurance, real estate combined. It's smaller uh, by 5 million than healthcare and social service, but it's a significant uh, activity in its own right. Uh, output of about 2.7 million. Uh, but here's the important thing: it's punching way uh, uh, above. Or excuse me, it's punching way above its weight. But I want to talk first. Uh, you know, wages nearly double uh, the average wage, uh, and and contrary to what one might expect, uh, this is not only the Mark Newburns of the world. It's not only PhDs and masters uh, people and engineers. One out of two of these jobs are uh, available to someone with less than a four-year degree. So this is an interesting 
surprising mix of uh, highly qualified, advanced professional engineers, but then a lot of people with uh, a modest level of STEM dexterity able to work uh, in the production side of these industries, whether it's technicians or robot operators or what have you. So uh, I think it, one point I just want to touch on here is that this is, uh, while this is uh, not uh, the answer for our opportunity problems in America, this, these are more accessible as industries and employers uh, uh, for uh, all kinds of people than people think. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want to talk, though, the, the, the industries punch way above their weight in terms of, you know, okay, 9% of workforce, 18% uh, of GDP, so these are extremely productive uh, firms uh, and, and industries that are punching above their weight uh, and uh, highly productive. Uh, they're 60% of exports. They employ 80% of our engineers as a country. Uh, they generate 80% of the patents, and they, these firms are, are responsible for 90% of private sector R&D. So this is our innovation base as a country uh, and as a region. Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, that, you know, th th you'll agree that this, these are a significant swath of industries. Um, and as such, uh, they're the core driver of the economy and, and radiating uh, impacts. Uh, uh, they drive product productivity in other industries. They support extremely long supply chains. Um, and they stimulate local economies. Uh, we calculate a local economic multiplier of this group of industries. It varies across them, but uh, of about one for every direct advanced industry job. Uh, and another 1.4 outside uh, the industry. So the 12 million direct jobs, uh, you know, are supporting, you know, about 30 million uh, 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 jobs in the country. So, you know, these are crown jewel industries for any region. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this is a consequential uh, swath of the economy. Let, let's talk though about uh, some trends that we're seeing in the economy. Let's drill down in, uh, on a few things. In aggregate, over the long term, the sector's employment has, I think, driven by extreme productivity gains, gone sideways. It, uh, 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 you know, output has soared, uh, but with essentially the same job base that it had over 20, you know, uh, since 1980. Uh, uh, so GDP growth was 20% uh, faster in these sectors than the rest of the economy. Uh, since the recession, uh, uh, both employment and output have grown, though, faster. And employment has begun to tick up in, the in, in these uh, 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 industries. Uh, uh, we're trying to get a handle on that. Uh, you know, I think there has been a recovery in the manufacturing, on the manufacturing side to an extent, uh, and, and simply the strong growth in some of the uh, services that we'll see uh, as contributing. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, advanced industry sector has added a million jobs since the crash. Uh, the employment and output growth is uh, uh, 1.8 and 1.6 times higher than the rest of the economy. So advanced services like computer systems and web services have led the growth. Um, certain manufacturing industries have added thousands of jobs. Uh, and lying behind these trends are diverse and changing stories. This is not a monolithic uh, set of industries, though I'm saying that they are related to each other. Uh, real annual output growth is up all over the sector, but the pace of it varies. Uh, 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 across industries. As you can see, semiconductor manufacturing on the left, communications equipment have seen, uh, you know, astronomical growth in output. Uh, uh, you know, uh, energy, you know, metal ore uh, uh, mining has uh, seen a huge output surge uh, in annual, on an annualized basis. And then certainly, you know, software uh, um, has been a, a strong performer. Uh, and across the, uh, in, in the recent years. Uh, you know, the, uh, in terms of employment growth, you can see that that too varies. 
uh, this is really actually pretty fascinating to me. You got, you know, pharmaceuticals ha are employing uh, significantly more people, uh, had uh, strong annual growth. Motor vehicles are now positive in the United States, but look at all of the, the, the carnage across the manufacturing body uh, uh, array of industries. Manufacturing in general is now extremely productive, uh, but it is doing it with uh, you know, negative job growth. <laughs> Uh, you know, some of that's offshoring, but it's also automation. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing strong employment growth in computer systems, uh, uh, design, software, uh, but satellite telecom uh, negative. So this gives you a sense of the variation of these industries. Uh, um, you know, IT to the right, you know, is, we're talking about you know eight, nine, ten percent annual uh, growth in, in recent years. Now, the economy. Uh, one of the things we like to say at the Metro program uh, at Brookings is that we don't have a national economy. We don't really have state economies. We have a linked network of individual regional economies, uh, ecosystems, if you will. You could talk about supply chains. You could talk about clusters, but we know uh, from all of our work that we see w that we have an extremely variegated uh, uh, map across industry after industry, economic uh, indicator after economic indicator. So, uh, you know, first, this is a metropolitan activity. 70% of the advanced industry uh, jobs in the country are, occur within the nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas. You don't see pharmaceutical operations or software for the most part, you know, in uh, uh, the middle of Montana. Uh, you see uh, these are largely urban activities, many of them. Uh, so that's a, you know, and, and that I think comports with knowledge transfer theory, uh, uh, all kinds of synergies at the local level. Uh, but let's, let's look at this map though, uh, uh, you know, based Every one of the 100 largest metros has some presence, at least a few thousand uh, advanced industry jobs. Uh, but the specialization, the size, uh, the depth of those clusters varies e extremely. Look at this map. Uh, San Jose, uh, right up here, has an incredible, you know, 30% of jobs are direct employment in these industries uh, that we've said pay twice as much as the rest of the uh, nation's jobs. Uh, Seattle, 16%. Wichita, 15.5%. Detroit, 15% of these. Big part of that's auto, but they have surprising uh, engineering-oriented presence, and that's driving uh, uh, a lot of uh, economic act activity there. San Francisco, 14%. But then at the other end, you've got places like Lakeland, Florida, 3.9%, McAllen, uh, Texas, 2%, essentially no uh, advanced industry presence. So to put this in perspective, a worker in San Jose is 15 times more likely to be in an advanced industry, one of the industries we say has the brightest future, uh, than a worker in McAllen. So there are tremendous variations in, in the economic activity uh, uh, and the specialization of regions. And the nature of regions' uh, specializations varies. Uh, 38 of the 100 metros, uh, largest metros, support largely manufacturing-oriented advanced industry sectors. Detroit, we talked about motor vehicles, parts, iron, steel, mills. Uh, Palm Bay, Florida, surprising audio and video equipment, semiconductors, photonics. Uh, Boise, computer and peripheral semiconductors, strong focus in high-tech manufacturing. Uh, um, you know, so there are, in, you know, Wichita is an interesting for that. Few metros involved in, um, uh, you know, energy. Salt Lake City, a lot of ore, met, uh, iron uh, or metal ore mining. Uh, Oklahoma City, oil and gas, fulcrum of the uh, natural gas uh, uh, and other energy activities. Birmingham, a huge complex of electric power generation. And then there are, uh, you know, services places that San Francisco, clearly Denver, a satellite telecom, 
uh, cable programming, data processing, Boston, the classic, you know, software, scientific R&D, biotech, web services, and, and Washington, D.C., satellite telecoms, scientific R&D, consulting, a huge amount of software tied to the uh, defense base. So you see, there are a lot of ways to participate in this economy, um, uh, a lot of different specializations. Let's, let's, uh, and then there's a, a, a group of balanced metro areas, San Jose, Seattle, Austin, deep in all facets, participating in, in really deeply in these economies, synergies building up across manufacturing into software and back. Uh, you know, this, the, these are probably the most uh, resilient economies in the country uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the future technology evolution. Let's look, this, this state uh, uh, ranks low in terms of its presence, uh, a thin, a thin uh, advanced industry, but it's surprisingly, uh, you know, uh, but uh, one that is growing. Um, uh, only 5.1% uh, uh, of jobs in it, 61,000 jobs statewide, 10% job growth since 2010, uh, significantly better than, than the rest of the economy. Uh, statewide strengths, data processing and hosting, pharma and medicine, manufacturing, computer systems design, software uh, and metal ore mining. Uh, so it's a, uh, there's a presence here, $16 billion output uh, and you know, uh, pretty good output growth uh, since 2010. Um, Las Vegas, closer to interest, uh, 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 you know, less, uh, looks a little less good on output growth, but uh, job growth since 2010, about 9%. Uh, top growth interest, data processing, again, computer science, medical and diagnostic, uh, software, uh, very strong here. Um, and what's interesting is uh, we're, you know, the annualized output here is very good. Uh, it compares favorably uh, both to the state and nationally. Uh, we're talking in uh, data processing, hosting, uh, output change, uh, gone up about 40% uh, a year since 2010, 20% uh, a year gains in software. So some of the things that, uh, you know, the activities uh, that have become pretty well known here uh, are generating real value. Um, now, so these are some positive trends. I want to, uh, you know, now darken uh, the story a little bit nationally uh, because it's important to access, uh, you know, okay, we're seeing, we're seeing We've identified the presence of a, a, a swath of industries, and then we have uh, noted variations uh, uh, and uh, kind of studied its uh, shape. It's important to look at its competitiveness on a worldwide basis. And here uh, the story becomes uh, uh, more troubling. Uh, I want to go into a few things here. Uh, you know, first, uh, 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 let's look at three indicators. Uh, first, uh, I want to talk about the productivity. Uh, the U.S. is still one of the most productive advanced industry countries in the world. Uh, and yet, since 1999, Austria, Denmark, Germany, Hungary, and Sweden have all enjoyed faster uh, productivity uh, you know, across these industries. Uh, um, so we're number eight, or whatever it is, is not uh, uh, the, the most encouraging, uh, you know, uh, uh, rallying cry, um, you know. And, uh, you know, I think that there are real questions about our, our uh, the, the uh, momentum uh, in the sector. Uh, let's look at the concentration uh, uh, in these industries. You can look to, from the left across, you can see, a number of industry uh, uh, nations, Korea, Germany, Japan, Finland, are increasing their presence in these crown jewel industries. The U.S. is one of a group of countries that are, you know, transferring out uh, of these industries as a share of economic activity. I think that's uh, troubling. Uh, clearly, if we're saying that these are the core source of uh, uh, export income, uh, anchors of the traded sector, 
you know, we're losing ground as a whole. Uh, finally, uh, and the most telling, uh, is uh, uh, negative trade balances. Uh, advanced industries export more than a trillion uh, worth of goods, anchor some of our most successful industries, uh, um, and account for about 60% of U.S. exports, so that's all good. But the U.S. all the same ran a $630 billion trade deficit in advanced industries in 2012. Um, stark warning uh, on competitiveness. You can see uh, here most of the nation's deficit owes to goods exports uh, and, import and, and energy. Uh, clearly, you know, the energy line is beginning to come back up uh, with uh, unconventional shale and oil uh, gas uh, reducing dependency. Um, but there, there are some, you know, you can see aerospace uh, is a big winner for the country. Uh, we have a positive trade balance, but uh, if you look across here, uh, uh, trade deficits are, are, are seen even in purported strengths, uh, like compute communications equipment, computer equipment, motor vehicles, and pharma. You know, so there's something wrong with that picture. Uh, uh, energy industries, you know, remain negative, but uh, the, you know the uh, uh, shale and oil boom will help. Um, uh, so the, the bottom line here is that uh, productivity, output, and trade data all suggest the U.S. competitiveness in advanced industries is uh, at minimum under threat. And we've said that these are a crucial anchor of our economy. Uh, now let's go a little farther and talk about you know the why. Uh, of these uh, of this troubling slippage, we talk about a lot of factors. Uh, the high U.S. Is, uh, has a high corporate tax rate compared to the world. Uh, um, that doesn't help. Neither does U.S. failure uh, to challenge and reverse competitor nations' unfair uh, trade practices and mercantilism. I think that's uh, a, a real factor. We've seen uh, uh, nations uh, unfairly subsidize. Uh, industries or uh, uh, and play games with uh, trade rules. But I want to focus on uh, three areas of concern. First, Americans need to recognize that technology innovation is absolutely critical to this uh, swath of industries. And our advantage is, is frankly uh, slipping. The uh, U.S. maintains a, a, formi a formidable technology development base, no doubt, but R&D investments are slipping. Uh, as a country, as you see here, patenting uh, per million workers uh, uh, over the last uh, few years uh, uh, has, has really slipped um, uh, beneath competitors like Japan, Switzerland, Finland, and Germany. This is a relatively new development. Uh, and, you know, we don't fully understand what's going on here. Clearly, there are new models of research. There may be uh, uh, other influences, but uh, you know our unchallenged dominance of patenting uh, is slipping, and it's not just the rise of the rest. I mean, you can see that our established challengers have have upped their game. Uh, uh, you know, it's not just new emerging nations getting into the game and uh, uh, patenting heavily. Uh, second, we need to know, acknowledge the nation has developed a serious. Uh, uh, skills deficit by comparison to its uh, competitors. Uh, here, uh, you know, one can detail a ton of depressing metrics. I'm not going to uh, pile on, but uh, uh, for now, I just want to note that U.S. students uh, and young workers' tepid interests in STEM subjects, you know, again, uh, the close to Mark Newburn's heart and others, uh, but critical science, tech, engineering, and math disciplines uh, as uh, really quite uh, um, uh, you know, mediocre share of population, uh, working age population with a STEM degree. Uh, U.S. is number 27. It's not bad, but uh, it's not good enough. Uh, percentage of graduates majoring in STEM fields, U.S. is 33rd, uh, less than one in five uh, 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 graduates of, of an uh, undergraduate degree has a STEM uh, 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 credential. So, uh, you know, these are why uh, in other work we're bringing out in a few uh, weeks, we're uh, going to 
suggest some ways that are, uh, Nevada can crack the code on improving its STEM workforce. And I think that's post-Tesla, uh, post, uh, you know, as we see this growth in some of the IT areas, the long uh, 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 difficult difficulties in hiring, uh, it, you know, I think are becoming a constraint for some of your most, uh, you know, growth, your growing companies. Uh, so, and then finally, uh, you know, Americans need to realize that the nation has allowed uh, its advanced industries platform as, as visible in its metropolitan regions uh, uh, to atrophy. Advanced industries cluster in specific places because they can secure the inputs they need there to compete globally. But check out these maps. This is so, uh, something I published uh, uh, last month. Uh, um, 1980 on the left, 50 of the country's largest 100 metropolitan areas had at least 10% of their workforce in advanced industries. Okay, so 10% uh, were engaged in the, this kind of high synergistic, val high value synergistic activity, whether it's in advanced te high tech manufacturing or software and so on. Uh, and since then, by 2013, only 23 metropolitan areas have that density, which I would say is a kind of threshold platform for being able to participate in these industries and being able to advance, uh, you know, innovation, being able to stay with the f cutting edge. So, yeah, we have some of the strongest ecosystems in the world, Bay Area, Seattle, Boston, Austin, Denver maybe, uh, but uh, there are fewer of those, and I argue that those are the platforms for state success and national success. So, you know, we're going in the wrong direction uh, there. Um, you know, bottom line, less than half as many large metropolitan areas now have that kind of really deep supplier base and skills base uh, and talent pools necessary to support advanced industry growth. So that's a problem. My bottom line here is the advanced industries sector is pivotal, but its viability uh, is a uh, challenge. In Nevada, uh, we, there is substantial opportunity uh, to build on a thin presence, but you're going to have to make some, you know, execute on some things. So let's talk a little about strategy, and then I'm going to want to open it up to conversation. Um, where does this leave us? Um, you know, what do governments and regional industry leaders need to do to, to defend uh, and extend uh, metro areas, uh, critical advanced industries, uh, you know, specifically, uh, you know, what should the state of uh, Nevada do? UNLV, what should LVGA do? Uh, others be doing to drive this industry? Uh, a lot needs to be done, but I'm, uh, you know, at Brookings, uh, we're focusing on three uh, strategy compass points. So we, we can talk about the nation's uh, tax uh, structures that probably don't help. We can talk a lot about a number of national issues, uh, but I, uh, I want to focus on, on three here, uh, three, major, three major areas. The first is simply committing as a nation or recommitting as a nation uh, and as regions uh, to the innovation economy uh, by recommitting to, to uh, uh, R&D and and, and everything that is needed to support tech transfer. Above all, that means building the infrastructure of technology development, which means committing to basic and applied research, building uh, research specializations aligned with regional industries. You're, you get this drift, I, this focus on regional ecosystems. Uh, that's where the action occurs uh, in, con in, in in, co in, in, in interactions with various institutions. So, you know, I think this entails in Nevada committing as a state to significantly expand um, the universities and DR, DRI's basic and applied research enterprise and building research specializations, again, that are aligned. And then, you know, bring it down even farther, you know, the tier one research status for uh, UNLV, you know, is a critical driver, uh, you know, is exactly the right uh, kind of strategy. Uh, um, let's talk uh, about skills. I mean, 
the state and the region have just got to pile on to upgrading the state STEM talent pipeline. You can't uh, uh, build the uh, presence in these industries without the kind of skills base uh, uh, in STEM uh, especially. Uh, we'll be releasing this full-on agenda in, in next month. For now, I'll just say that you know, technically trained workers whether with a two-year or, or professional credentials are absolutely uh, critical. Uh, I was just visiting with uh, the CEO of Banjo, this very interesting company doing sort of social media graphs for the world and uh, you know, inc incredibly interesting business when you begin to understand what they're doing. Uh, he said that, so he's got uh, 40 people working in Redwood City and 30 people working here, because of difficulties in hiring, he feels he could be five times bigger here, um, and he feels it's a material drag on growth. So uh, if you don't have the workers, uh, and they needn't be professional, they can be, many of them can be sub-baccalaureate, uh, uh, you know, you, you will constrain your growth. So I think, you know, there's a few highlights of how, I think you've got to have a vision as a state of STEM's importance and begin drilling this into uh, families and, and kids coming up. You've got to make it exciting. You've got to make it visible. Uh, we'll have a lot to say about how to do that. Um, somewhat in parallel to my first point uh, on innovation about the importance of alignment between industry and your, your uh, uh, innovation resources. You've got to invest in industry-aligned regional skills initiatives. It's not just training for training's sake, it's training that is linked and aligned and informed by the specific granular needs of, of these you know, companies that are moving fast and trying to uh, you know, compete uh, globally. And then you've got to address the state's basic proficiency crisis. Uh, the, over time, the pipeline will, will come up dry if you're not uh, able to intervene with in the K through 12. You know, it really gets down to third or fourth grade, really, uh, to excite and engage uh, kids in, in this uh, swath of, you know, pretty, I think, pretty exciting uh, industries. Um, you know, and I think, uh, and finally, our research is showing the importance of regional clusters um, and supply chains in, in advanced industry growth. The state and regions have got to work together to foster uh, states emerging local ecosystems. This isn't, uh, you know, just a, a broad directive. These industries uh, uh, do deals, find their workers, uh, uh, develop technology, run their supply chain in specific local places. So that's the place to intervene. Uh, means focusing on bottom-up regional economic development. Uh, uh, it means aiding and abetting the emergence of clusters, uh, the attention to deepening supply chains, and then it's about creating more and richer net networking and, and collaboration uh, uh, hubs, which I think is beginning to happen. Uh, in, in Las Vegas. The downtown project's been helpful here. I think the stuff uh, Rob Roy's doing with the Innovation Center, these are, are real uh, and important uh, 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 ways to accelerate knowledge exchange. So, uh, you know, there you have three focuses, innovation, uh, skills, and then these ecosystems. I think those are the, uh, the crucial um, uh, ways to, to try to drive the, uh, the expansion of these industries and be supportive. In any event, you know, you get the drift though. Um, the real estate economy is always going to be important uh, to Nevada. So will tourism, so will gaming, but so is diversification. It's an imperative. And my uh, candidates for economic diversification are uh, these advanced industries. Uh, the state has targeted some of these to its credit. Uh, work going forward, it's got to work to you know, drill down on innovation, drill down on skills, drill down on the ecosystem resources. Uh, you know, uh, I think that there's a, a lot of cause for, uh, you know, grounds for optimism uh, if some things can be 
uh, organized uh, a bit better. And uh, with that, I'm happy to just uh, spend some time kicking this around. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when I was looking at your chart of the distribution of the advanced industries. You mean the map? Uh, the map. How is that correlating to the universities in those regions? Uh, we've research? actually done some regression stuff. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of things. First, patenting is very tightly linked, not, not just to universities, but also uh, to partnerships within regions. Uh, so every, every, uh, there, there's no major uh, uh, advanced industry hub that does not have a strong, uh, you know, uh, university presence. Uh, you know, and, 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 it, and that may be, it's not just tech transfer, but it's also source of the best workers. Right? You've got to have a source of technically trained workers. I think our research, though, does point to more space for, again, sub-baccalaureate workers. And I think we, we feel that a great community college system um, can be very important for supporting employment. It may not lead you know, to the same technology presence, but is also very important. I mean, North Carolina's gone a long way you, you know, leveraging a great uh, now community college approach. Yeah, Tom. Since you have that map up, so. Yeah, everybody, maps are great. Yeah, huh? maps are great for spurring questions. So are we, are we to read from that map that a lot of those advanced industries have moved to other countries with the disappearance uh, okay, of those uh, Okay, two things areas? are, first, first the, the that, and, and I think that's a, a, a big, uh, explanation of all those negative bars and in both in, in employment across the manufacturing uh, right yeah like uh, here right so huge carnage across the manufacturing swath right and a lot of that is outsourcing uh, offshoring right so that's one thing but the other thing though is the reorientation or the morphing or tilt of the economy towards uh, essentially consumption. Uh, the country over 40 years uh, increased its dependency on imports. And meanwhile, the consumption economy grew much faster than these. Uh, so you've got two things happening. We've become relatively less oriented towards this kind of sophisticated production, and meanwhile, we outsourced a lot of it, especially in the manufacturing. Yeah. Here, let's see, Tom? Or, or excuse me, yeah, yeah. Good, Michael. Um, so, a uh, couple questions. I, I'm guessing that uh, your 1980 to, to 2013 slide, uh, you know, the map, um, reflected just a general um, decrease in the amount of industries, but uh, or I'm sorry, in the size of the industries in those metros, but I think that uh, going to the map that you were just on, a lot of the metros that are represented on the on the map uh, that you were just on still have a significant portion of those uh, of those industries, whether it be you know 10 percent or you know 8 percent. Yes, there, I mean there's a whole bunch that I mean there are, there are relative few that have intensified. There are a whole bunch of drifted downwards. This is a 10 percent. We're saying this is a, a healthy threshold to support, right, the kind of synergies. A whole bunch have drifted from the 10% down to the 6%. So that's who's happening the, too. Who's intensified? What's that? Or who is intensified? Uh, Seattle, uh, Boston, you know, the one, you know, Austin, right? And they've, they've specialized, uh, they've attracted, and they've just grown and they've been able to capitalize uh, you know, there's a suspicion that there's a kind of winner-take-all or front-runner dynamic in here. And we're doing some work trying to look at uh, the software industry, um, and there's some evidence that in some ways some portions of software have actually, you know, concentrated into fewer places, even at the same time some levels have drifted outward. So that these, these kind of synergies in regions can create a kind of lock-in 
where they kind of create a, almost an uh, event horizon. They start sucking in more and more activity. And I think, I think we could say that's happening in the Bay Area right now. You know, you've got social media exploding, but you also have all kinds of manufacturing. Uh, uh, I read, uh, it was Michael Malone, a great commentator, said we're now heading beyond the age of software into the age of devices. You know, there's now, a, you know, as you know, a dense manufacturing activity going on there too. So there may be a kind of, you know, real agglomeration going on. I can't help but notice, because it sticks out like it's sore thumb, uh, um, probably, what is that, Charleston, South Carolina, um, you know, on that map from 2013. Which has cleaned up in the last decade on foreign direct investment, you know, German investments in aerospace, auto, and so on, and then bringing with them German practices like apprenticeship and, you know, advanced supply chain management. Um, it's an interesting story there. I mean, so that's good leadership right there. You know, good leadership from the, the government saying we want this type of uh, partnership going forward. You know, reaching it, out to it, leadership does matter, like cr does. creating that kind of platform uh, that can be predictable and attractive. That they've turned themselves inside out on the skill side. Uh, last year, I worked uh, in Tennessee. Uh, on the auto industry there, it's astonishing how focused they are, not just in attracting the next big OEM or, uh, you know, tier one supplier, but it's all about skills, you know, and Governor Haslam is piled on to STEM workforce. Uh, they've done things, I mean, they implement a couple ideas we had about alignment, but the most impressive thing they did is they, they're applying uh, some, uh, uh, lottery proceeds to allow free community college for the first year sends a pretty powerful signal for the, and, they, and it's as they have a sense of the worker they need to allow VW to come in, right? It's not a PhD at this point. It's a, a capable community college graduate who can run a CAD machine or, you know, run a robot uh, supply chain, so. Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. It's Rob Roy and uh, Tony Shea, you know, outside of government, providing the leadership of the culture that we need here. Uh, and I think also some of these dots represent more capital, where you can get access to capital for startups. Uh, you know, we develop stuff here, and the capital is in the Bay Area. Right. These companies move to the Bay Area. Yeah. And we see that constantly. Arizona sees that constantly. Capital constantly. is probably one of the things you're probably, uh, you know, uh, politely jabbing us a little bit. Capital is one of the things we want to, we're trying to consider how we talk about it because it's clearly important. And both that the, I mean, I think it's less at an early stage problem. I'm, I'm more concerned about the scale up uh, later stage and first demonstrations. I think that's where we have a problem in this country. Yeah, hey Tom. I wanted to ask you something about building up the innovation capabilities in, in these regions and if you've looked at all kind of the, the trends in that, you know, because as, as you probably know and you've probably looked at, kind of the, the federal level and federal investment in R&D has been relatively flat. I don't think it's declining, but it's probably relatively flat. And After the of, huge pulse through the Recovery Act, right. we have a kind yeah, of I mean, de, you know, and, and you know, I'm worried about a kind of de-federal, you know, right. So, so it's, and, it, and becoming more competitive, so well, what we've seen a little bit, at least this past year, and I don't know if it's a continued trend, and I don't know if you've seen this other places, but the role of states, the increasing role of states in investing in, in innovation and I love it. This is something. And the diversification of R&D portfolios. This is a topic seen. that I, I've, I've been sending a ton of emails with my team. We're trying to figure out how to look. At, I, I, you, you've read my mind. That is, I think, a very interesting possible dynamic that is going to start. And I think there's evidence of it already. We looked at uh, shares of total R&D output on the government side. And state side has been creeping up, especially in the big states, New York, Texas, and California, with these, you know, have huge budgets. You know, they may not be spending huge percentage shares, but it's becoming a meaningful contribution to, to the 
kind of uh, uh, you know assemblage of innovation inputs. The thing that's int I mean, th that is maybe problematic because it's going to be the states with big governments and big resources that are going to be able to enter the fray. You know, so I mean, you got to think how can states of modest means get into the game. Yeah, Tom, we just want them to fund, you know, me. Well, I, I'm worried about the higher also, education budget. But it's also normalized to the, you know, the, I mean, big states, California, they've also got yeah. a lot of right. institutions I mean, it'll move the too. statistic. I mean, you know, you know, conventional neoclassical economics says, you know, that R&D is something that has to be nationalized because of spillovers, right, at the local level, right. that you know, localities will not be able to capture well, their investments. I think big states feel they can, <laughs> yeah. right? And I think, I think this is counter to the conventional wisdom that somehow R&D is, you know, manifestly a federal activity. Now, I'm a, I'm a sort of radical... Well, did the stem cell. Yeah, yeah no, exactly, the through cell, ballot yeah. measure. I'm, I'm kind of a radical devolver and believe in the power of states in metropolitan areas. Uh, as we do at the Metro program, but I think it's just got to happen. There is no uh, projection on the federal budget that makes you at all encouraged about the future of federal R&D budgets, right? And if you want to have, ca you know, if you want to control your destiny, I mean, some st I think more states are going to try to intervene. And, and I think it's a potentially new model because I suspect a lot of those areas like Boston, Colorado, Denver, others probably grew out of federal investment, yeah. probably. In, and, in and California, you know, I mean, you mentioned stem cell, you know, they put hundreds of millions of dollars in, in the last decade. So if you want to write a Brookings brief on this topic, it sounds like you're fired up. I think this is a very interesting, I, 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 I really think over, you know, 20 years lit from now, we're going to see that the balance of, you know, uh, uh, in uh, R&D flows, the sourcing of them is going to really change. Yeah, yeah, great, Mike. Just coming off but by the same token, I mean, there's there's a uh, inherent, um, I, I wouldn't say danger, but it, states are going to focus on what is relevant to their home industries, and yeah. you know, in a state like Nevada, which is always you know going to be, uh, you know, gaming entertainment you know, mining maybe uh, to some extent is always going to be relevant to it. Um, you know, yeah. some, uh, at some point, you know, investing, uh, I, I imagine that, I, I don't have any evidence of this, but, uh, but you know, um, I imagine that t a lot of Texas's state R&D is geared towards the energy yeah. industry. No, that's really interesting. I mean, you're saying there's a kind of political economy point here that if, we're go if states and metros are more on their own, uh, we're going to get, you know, outcomes of different types uh, and different. Sounds like you're worried that the strong could get, the strong and advanced industries could get stronger, right? Right. I mean, you, you know, Massachusetts has a deep advanced industry, high tech economy. They dominate the legislature, right? So that's, that's interesting. Whereas. I mean, yeah, I think we're all sensing that in technology economies, there's often all kinds of lock-in. You know, we were talking about that a minute ago. I mean, you're, I hadn't quite thought of this yet. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I think this is a, a great topic for future investigation. Great. Thanks for bringing it up. Other thoughts? I was curious about other, on one slide you showed uh, since procession um, investment and productivity in advanced industries and a big dent, uh, there you go, yeah. um, big dent in output uh, from 2012 to 2013. Yeah, uh, you know what, the, uh, this is, remember through the first couple years of the recovery, the rest of the world, uh, was in better shape than the U.S. And I remember manufacturing kind of drove the immediate stabilization of the U.S. That's what I think that is. U.S. Uh, 
output you know, really bounced back pretty, pretty well in these types of industries as we exported to the rest of the world. And exports went relatively higher, and that, that's kind of flattened. And meanwhile, you know, we've had a sort of world trough. Export is declining, and that may be depressing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one theory. Uh, it isn't, we don't fully understand uh, what all is going on, but they're clearly manufacturing its contribution has recovered since the crash, you know. And we're now, we're now positive uh, in employment for the first time in 40 years, uh, we're seeing employment growth in manufacturing in the country. And these are the most competitive, these are the manufacturing we want. You know, we, want, we don't want to be making, uh, uh, you know, uh, low low end commodity widgets in the United States. We want to be manufacturing airplanes, right? And we have done pretty well with that. So, all right. Yeah. Hi. Um, you brought up there's a couple of questions that I have here, but you brought up one of the slides where you talked about the uh, the output in terms of dollar amounts, and you had said 16 billion for the entire state, with 6 billion coming out of Las Vegas. Right. Um, indicating 10 billion is coming from somewhere else. Yeah, a little Where bit. Where is it coming from? Okay, you got a big, big contribution from mining. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. And, so you know, and. The technology aspect, you're, you're lumping mining into that. We, w mining is, in our view, an advanced industry. It uh, qualifies as high R&D and has a lot of engineers and STEM workers, and it's extremely efficient. Uh, when I look at that, I look at the piece, though, where you indicated that there was a blue dot for Southern Nevada indicating a 2.0 to a 5.8 percentage uh, yeah. of uh, STEM-based opportunities, yeah. right. but zero for Northern Nevada, per se. Let's say, um, you know, we talk about Tesla, we talk uh, about... It's not here because it's not in the largest 100 metros. Okay. All right. So it's because you know, Reno of the city has, size. Reno has, a pre the the Reno has a presence in this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, I think you guys are stronger in software. I think they have a little deeper kind of high-tech high -tech manufacturing, and clearly Tesla's going to help that. Uh, the other I, thing on your charts, you don't reference China whatsoever on anything. That's, that a, good, that's a good point. I mean, we are going to, in this report, we're going to talk more about, but I think indirectly we've talked about offshoring, and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, Quick theory, uh, we, we think that actually uh, U.S. competitiveness in uh, a increasingly automated environment, I mean, is going to improve. And we see a lot of, you know, I think we, we may see reshoring here, but without huge job growth. You know. yeah, no, Insource is coming back, particularly, there's one particular industry that you haven't talked about, which is, you keep mentioning Tesla, but in reality, it's Panasonic, it's battery manufacturing yeah, in the state That's of Nevada. Uh, could very well become, that could be the third largest industry for the entire state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And from the food chain and supply chain resources for that industry, yeah. uh, you know, there's a significant amount of opportunity. I think that's a great point. I mean, we've seen labor, labor cost differentials have have narrowed uh, as wages have gone up there. Now, now those uh, 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 those decently paid Chinese production workers are now going to lose their jobs because Foxconn is going to automate well, they've been, they've been their jobs. Them regularly, I mean, workforces, particularly yeah. in the electronic sector, right. have been automating Absolutely. over the last uh, and I think five years. The U.S. can compete in that environment. Definitely. If they were talking about a flat world, right of you know, automation in China or automation here, you're going to automate in the United States. And yeah, the problem is, is that we don't, we're not part of the supply chain. The, the battery is not ending up in a device. A lot. That's, that's what the two China. map thing I'm trying to get at. A lot has happened over 40 years. We've given away a lot of capabilities, and we're going to have to rebuild. That was one of the comments when you said you were talking about from financing and getting into manufacturing. Uh, you know, issues when you looked at your chart. One of the biggest issues that's come across. So many people that I've talked to in the manufacturing sector is that, from a banking and finance standpoint, unless I can show 16 times earnings to yeah, a bank, nobody's right. going to finance me putting a building up yeah. to start building things. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, when we're, t I mean, it, you know, l large scale finance for, you know, production activities is probably something that maybe, you know, we do need federal intervention on, you know, and at minimum, you know, these, we have, you know, the, uh, I'm very supportive of this creation of a network of manufacturing uh, hubs, manufacturing innovation hubs. I think finance uh, actors should be part of each of those, right? You know, if you're going to construct a presence in advanced manufacturing, uh, you know, finance challenges for scale up is critical, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. Good. Well. There's a last question. We can take it, but uh, Mark will also be around if you have a yeah, absolutely. question you want to follow up with or didn't get a chance to ask. But let me thank Mark. Let me thank you for your great questions. I yeah, love, thank you, I everybody. I love this stuff. You saw, you're seeing a work in progress here, so yeah. you've had a great influence on that work. i got a few <laughs> notes already here. So uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, we'll be back with a, another public lecture in two weeks, not next week, but the week after. And we'll have a colleague out from Brookings and we'll be looking at health information exchange mm. systems and how states are handling that differently. And uh, if you have an interest in the, in the health sector, please come and join us. Thanks great. again for coming. Yeah, here, here, yeah great. Here are my con contacts and Brookings Mount West and ourselves in the Nevada STEM Coalition on November 12th has a, a major event on STEM that I encourage you all to check out. I mean, it's going to be a serious discussion. So thanks a lot. Really, really good input, too. I think several things I've got to go write in my book here. Thanks a lot, guys.